Tonight on Pacific Report, the British Columbia Penitentiary. A century of memories remains, but now the walls are down. And within a year, new inhabitants will be here, but they'll be living in housing developments instead of cell blocks. Hi, I'm Terry Glakoff, and this is what's left of the old BC Penitentiary. It was built in 1878, and now, more than 100 years later, it's coming down. Its record of rehabilitation is not a proud one. Most of the men who did time here had already been in federal prisons. Rather than a monument to correction, it's more of a reminder that we've yet to find a better answer for salvaging those who commit crimes against society. Tonight, we repeat Ray Corelli's story about the old BC pen, and a warning, you may find the language offensive. Welcome to the BC Pen, or what's left of it. They built this place when Victoria was queen and they closed it three years ago. The guards and the inmates are long gone, but the ghosts, well, the ghosts remain. They haunt the gloomy acres of this cast iron and concrete monument to despair. The pen was started in 1873 and completed in 1878. In the following 102 years, more than 30,000 men spent part or all of their lives within its walls. Is this your first time back? Is it just, is it Gordy back? is one of those men. He came out of the pen in 1974. Ask him how long he was inside, and he replies, five Christmases. Gordy has no permanent job and doubts he will find one. He thinks he may be too old. This visit revives memories, and his hands shake. Welcome home. This place, when you first came in as a newcomer, must have been a pretty frightening experience. Oh, it was, it was scary, yeah. Do the people on the outside, the, the so-called, the streets, have any idea, do you think, what it's like to be in here? No way. I bet if you took, uh, just went up Granville Street and just picked 10 people at random and put them in these cells overnight, I bet half of them would go bonkers. Gordy didn't go bonkers. His cell, in fact, was often a refuge from unpredictable violence. The BC pen was maximum security. Its 30-foot walls held some of the most dangerous men in the country. They got only 20 minutes a day in the exercise yard. Gordy minded that less than most. He studied the complete works of Shakespeare, philosophy, political science, even journalism. How do you keep from going absolutely right out of your mind? Well, I read. Yeah. Maybe that's all I, but some guys, there were a lot of illiterate guys in here. Guys couldn't even fill out their canteen slips. And uh, they couldn't do anything. They'd just sit here and pace their cells or just lie and stare at the ceiling, you know. And I don't know how they did it. What about the people you knew here? Did you ever want to see any of them again? Oh, yeah. Geez, I met a lot of good people here. A lot of real good, solid guys. But a lot of pukes, too. Yeah. You know, a lot of guys I'd never want to see again. You know, Once I saw a guy with his guts hanging out, he was holding him in. He was a rapo. And uh, it was on another wing. A rapo? You mean he was a convicted rapist? Or, you know, yeah, a convicted rapist. He tried to sneak in, uh, you know, saying that he was in for theft or something, or B&E or whatever. And, uh, well, the cons always find out. The cons usually know before the bulls, you know, what, what is happening in here. Our grapevine was pretty good. And um, the guy lasted about two days before he got carved open. And then there was always guys getting their cells torched. Well, they would even feel like, to shut your light off, you had to unscrew your light bulb. And then somehow they would drill a hole in the, in the light bulb, fill it with gas. Guy would come in, slam his gate, turn on his light bulb, 
and boom, it would be like a firebomb. One day I'm coming in after school on Friday, and um, I see this strange guy come out of my cell. And I look and I thought, oh, my laundry connection got this guy to bring my thing over. So, okay, I had three pairs of jeans. I feel a piece of paper in my pocket, pull it open, and there's a love note in it. Well, Christ, then I got really scared, because I'm not a queer, and, uh, but this guy. Is there a lot of homosexuality in prison? There's quite a bit, but not as much as people think. Yeah. You know, like, I never, never got interested in that. I know a lot of, a lot, most of my friends were never interested in it. But there was some, uh, but they were, you know, they stayed to themselves. I'd say, uh, I don't know, maybe 10%. What were the guards like? Were the guards? The guards, well, some of them were okay. They were just doing their job. And you gotta remember, they were in the pen too. They were just like doing time. And some were real bastards, you know, for real, real bastards. In the cold and the stink and the isolation, generations of guards and prisoners coexisted uneasily down through a hundred years of war and peace. Guards were beaten, prisoners were lashed, and in 1912 they hanged an inmate who had killed a guard. In the mid-30s, the convicts went on strike and tore up their cells. An inmate once hurled a gasoline bomb at a guard. Forged identity cards used by accomplices on the outside to cash checks were traced to the prison print shop. In the early 1950s, 300 members of the Sons of Freedom Dukabor sect went on a hunger strike that lasted 33 days. Now and then, men tried to escape. Some got away, but not many. In the late 50s and early 60s, the federal government embarked on prison reform by doing away with the lash and other harsh measures. But reform backfired. The 70s brought explosive, unremitting tension and full-scale riots. When you just walk along, you can feel the tension. I don't know how you can tell, but even you can, oh, when something is happening, you just know. Why do they do it when they know they can't win? Well, they did win. They got this place closed down. The riots flare one after the other. In 1970, inmates riot for eight hours to protest the death of a prisoner who they claim was murdered. This is the east gate of the BC Penitentiary where a few short hours ago, a night-long session of violence ended. 285 prisoners inside went on the rampage. That's out of a population of 450, a total prison population. On October 6, 1973, inmates demanding more time outside their cells and for recreation set fires and smashed windows. On September 25, 1976, nine inmates take hostages while 200 others destroy the east cell block causing damage of $1.6 million. The hostages are released after 40 hours of negotiation. On April 27, 1979, one inmate is beaten to death by another and 41 prisoners demonstrate in the East Block. The inmates are ordered to pay for the damage. That was the Penn's last riot, but it was not the most tragic. The most infamous uprising occurred on June 9, 1975, when three prisoners took 15 hostages. The standoff lasted for two days and came to a violent end. Mary Steinhauser, a classification officer, was shot and killed in this building when it was stormed by guards. This week's hostage incident is the third so far this year. Fortunately, in the other two, no lives were lost. But yesterday, a hostage was killed. And today, some serious questions are being asked, and answers are being demanded. While troops stood ready to move in if needed, guards broke into the one-story building and opened fire. One of the inmates suffered serious head wounds, and Mary Steinhauser was killed. She died where she and the others had been held by the prisoners, Andy Bruce, Dwight Lucas, and Claire Daniel Wilson. 
the end came in this room called the vault. She never bothered with the staff at all. She was an individual that pretty well stayed with herself. I didn't know her that well. Sandy Taylor worked at the B.C. Pen for 31 years as a guard and later a supervisor of the laundry and other prison services. He retired in 1979 because he could no longer take the pressure, which, he says, resulted from relaxed discipline and cuts in prison work programs. I could see things uh, weren't going right, and there was a constant uh, uh, riots and uh, hostage-taking. And uh... You seem to be saying that Penn officials had lost control of the place. They didn't seem to be taking hold of things, even though they had all these problems coming up, rather to try to straighten it out. And when they had a riot in the wing, uh, they never went in to stop it. They just let it completely ruin the place. And these things build up on you when you're uh, f feeling that it's a waste of public funds the way it was going. What kind of inmate frightened you the most? I would say uh, the quiet ones that uh, never say anything, you know. You never know what they're thinking. You can't get to know them at all. The ones that are boisterous, you know what he's like, and uh, love there's a lot of wind, but they're the quiet ones. You, you keep an eye on them. A lot of people say they're violent, but they weren't violent that much toward the staff. They'd fight among inmates, uh, other inmates, and periodically uh, an inmate would attack an officer. But uh, were you ever attacked? No, never was, no. Some of the most violent men in Canada came to the British Columbia Penitentiary. Some were more violent than others, and they usually wound up here, in solitary confinement, the hole. Inmates could be sent to the hall for weeks for almost any breach of prison discipline. At the B.C. Pen, it was called the penthouse because it was above the main cell block. These cells had steel doors. The ceiling light was never turned off. The prisoner had two blankets and slept on a concrete slab. He got one shower a week and exercised along this corridor under the muzzle of a guard's shotgun. Occasionally, inmate complaints about conditions reached television news crews outside and they would be allowed in by prison authorities to see for themselves. During the days of corporal punishment, if a prisoner rebelled, he was beaten with a leather strap called a paddle. Sandy Taylor had to take his turn wielding the paddle. That was all part of the uh, job. If you were uh, on, like on the guard staff at that time, there was all types of jobs, and uh, we all had to take our turns at it. How did you feel doing that? Well, it wasn't that uh, I didn't... Uh, volunteer for it. Yeah, I don't suppose anybody did. No, but it was just part of the job. You did yeah. it because you had to. I know I've spoken to a lot of the uh, the older inmates at different times, and they used to say, God, I wish to turn the clock back. It was easier to do time when things were tough, Yeah. when the discipline was tough, because they knew where they stood. And when uh, today the inmates, they don't know from one day to the other what they can get away with and what they can't. Coming up, the inhumanity of imprisonment. Tom spent 14 years in the B.C. pen for armed robbery. He's been straight now for eight years and has a job. He also has memories of the whole. When you came in here today, walking through this place, up these stairs to this part of the prison, how did you feel? Well, you're, you're kind of like an animal. You look like you're going to get attacked, you know, because they're all around you. When you're coming up to the hole, there's four or five guards around you, and then you have to strip off the, the you know, what humanity you have, it leaves you, because you have to bend over and spread your cheeks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. They shine a flashlight and what to expect to find them all. But, yeah, you, it's you really downgrading, yeah. You remember that sort of thing when you came in here today? Yes, I did, yeah. Did they put you in here without much excuse? Or did you have to do something pretty bad? Well, no, for myself, I've done something like get in here, yeah. Sure. Making home brew and stuff like that, drinking. I would have camp one time in Agassi, or working hard in the bush. And, the guy, the supervisor, he used to buy his booze and get his booze and yeah, get drinking and stuff like that, yeah. You told me one time that 
You told me about the guard who used to kick you when you came up the stairs? Well, one time, it never happened to me, but it was a famous thing. Uh, and uh, when you come up the stairs at the top here, you'd be handcuffed or something. Lots of times, he'd give you the boot in the chest and down you'd go. And when you'd you land down on a, on a landing part and he'd be right there with the boots to you. Like I saw one night a man hung himself and uh, i never forget Tommy and I were walking out here in the yard and you're not allowed to talk around and he, he was going real spinny. But Tommy got talking to him and not, none of them ever really bothered Tommy because he was a pretty heavy scrapper and he was a big man. And uh, so Tommy went to McCooster and he said, listen, you better... Who's McCooster now? McCooster was charged of the hole. Yeah. He was a ward, he was a guard in charge of the, yeah. the solitary. Yeah. The solitary and he said, you better get a hold of something because he's going to flip out. Because he said he can't get his medications. He was cut off medication. And he's locked up at this time. Yeah. Right? yeah. And anyway, the next day he was really yellowing. And that night he hung himself. And uh, I heard the commotion. And they took him. He dragged him out. And I looked down underneath the door. And he was there. And he had a towel wrap around his throat. And he laid on the floor for 45 minutes for anybody to come up. To see if he was alive? See if he was alive or dead, yeah. The thing that really bothered me in Preston wasn't too much myself. Or a guy's been in uh, three or four times. But when you see a new guy come in. Uh, a young fellow or something, and you feel kind of sad for him because he's sitting duck for everything. Mm. You know, he, he just lost in his new world, or some guy had been a strictly a square john guy, and uh, something happened, family problems or what have you, and, and the man was never known as a criminal or anything, and he comes and he ends into those places. He, he, yeah. It's sad. Well, the only reason I'm here today, uh, I figure it may help some young guy, it may not, it may plant a seed in him, but there's a better way of life than this. It's an awful way to live. This is Doug. He is now 59 years old and he is still on parole. He has no job and lives at a Vancouver center for ex-inmates. Between 1943 and 1973, Doug served a dozen terms in the B.C. pen. What was it like when you were here? Uh, well, the first time I was scared shitless because I was only 17 years of age. I wasn't even 17. I was just turning 17. You didn't, you're saying you did it. It was 30 years, I guess, overall that you spent in this place, eh? Different yeah, times. That's right. What were I, the... Uh, I might even have the record in this institution. I ain't sure. Just being locked up and uh, sexual frustrations and uh, uh, only being a 17 or 18 year old kid uh, being locked up in one of themselves <laughs> and full of piss and vinegar and wanting to do something with nothing to do, I guess you can imagine. Did you ever get used to it over the next 30 years? Did you ever really get used Did to I it? Did I ever get used to it? No, I never get used to it, but I. Uh, I adjusted to it, yeah. How did you adjust? I, well, simply out of necessity. It was a case of adjusting or winding up in the nut house, one or the other. Doug escaped the nut house, but teenaged rebelliousness got him in trouble. Like thousands of others, he ended up in the hole. I don't think I was lucky enough to get two blankets, but I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say I got two blankets. Uh, I got nothing to eat. I got uh, eight pieces, nothing to eat, I got something to eat. I got eight pieces of bread and uh, a cup of water at each meal. The one piece of reading you were given was the Bible. In the hole as well, eh? Yeah, right. It was an excellent piece of material for uh, rolling. Uh, if you were lucky enough to get some tobacco smuggled down there, it made good cigarette papers. One thing distinguishes this man from nearly all ex-inmates of our federal prisons. He was charged and convicted as an habitual offender and sentenced to an indefinite term in penitentiary. That law has been repealed, but the repeal was not retroactive, and Doug lives with the consequences, lifetime parole. Are you still bitter? About the habitual tag and all that kind of stuff? <laughs> bitter, ain't the word. Have you been able to get your life together since you've been out of here? No way. Do you think you will? Uh, yeah, I think if they ever get this yoke off my neck, yeah. Yeah. Does it follow you wherever you go? When you're sure it is. Like, for, oh, I'm trying to get a job, things like that. 
Well, try living. Just think about it for a minute. Uh, try living when you can't even pick a job of your own. The pro board's got to approve it. You can't even get married without them approving it. You can't buy a goddamn car without them approving it. So your whole life is just... So in a sense, you're still in prison? Huh. Prison, I sometimes wonder if it isn't better off in here. I can imagine why the guys that hung themselves, I had a brother who hung himself in Ocala, so I can appreciate why some of the guys hung themselves in here. What are we to make of all this? Well, not much, except for the fact that Men on the outside who were violent were violent in here. And crooks who weren't very good learned how to be better. It's not much of a legacy. I don't know what to tell How does this one rank compared to the others? This one here? Yeah. I would say, uh, well, it's the worst that I've ever had. When we return, I'll tell you what's happening at the BC Pen today. This is Pacific Report. Stay with us. There have been big changes at the BC Penitentiary since that report was prepared. A developer bought the land for $5 million. The memories and the rubble will be scattered as the bricks and the steel are recycled. $95 million will be spent making this a happier, more productive place. Instead of cell blocks, a new horizon of low rises, single family housing, and a retirement village. The original jail will be a service area for the new residents. The gatehouse, it used to be the doorway to an ancient attempt at solving a constant problem. In the future, instead of processing prisoners, it may house a trendy restaurant. And the old wall, only this section is still standing, and after a movie crew shoots a few scenes here in the new year, these bricks will come down too, and the last of the old cage will disappear. Next Monday is our first program of the new year, and we'll show you another side of the law. I'll have a profile of two of Vancouver's police officers. We'll follow them through their training to now, after almost a year on the beat. I'm Terry Glaykoff. Robert Osborne, Marlene Trotter, and all of us who work on the show have enjoyed bringing you our stories this year. We hope you'll join us in 87 for more of Pacific Report. <laughs>